Hi, my name is Dennis. Welcome to Foundations Linux Shell Scripting Basics. Let's get started on what we'll learn today. Our learning objectives include understanding common use cases for shell scripts and one-liners using your Linux terminal session. We'll create scripts that can perform operations based on file or user input, and also learn how to utilize regular expressions for use cases, such as manipulating data, searching for data, whether it be unstructured or structured data, and varying use cases. Now, the first thing's first. Shell scripting and scripting in general is all about automation. And really, when we talk about automation, we really mean that we're going to start off with an environment that needs to interpret what we're going to use. Shell scripting comes in a variety of fashions. In particular, we use Bash as our default terminal shell. So we would like to have the Bash environment be interpreted for us correctly. So bin bash is typically the way to parse the file. So we'll have that at the very beginning at the top of our shell script to go ahead and have the bash terminal interpret. We want to make sure that we are interpreting this as a bash shell script, not Perl and not Python. If you're going to export your script to a system outside of the system that you're building it on and you don't know the absolute path name, you can also use uh, the pound bang slash user slash environment slash bash uh, sorry slash uh, the bash instead and actually there is no stash right there I'm going to erase that and so actually you have all the above just like you would with Perl you'll know, just replace the word with Perl with bash and that's the better way to have exportation when you're creating uh, shell scripts that are portable, um, just in case you don't have the same path uh, variable right there for you. We'll see why that's important in a second. So like all scripts, there's always a conditional statement and we wanna automate as much as possible. There are three ways that we can do conditionals in most shell scripts. We can use selection, which is a combination of if and else. So if we make a conditional statement requiring here. We can say if it's true, go here, false, come over here, and then ultimately we continue on our path to our uh, execution workflow. We also have iteration, which is loops. So loops are considered things like for loops. So for one in every 10, for uh, items one in 10, you can do something. We also have do while loops. So while a condition meets something, or does not meet something, continue the loop until it is now false or true. And so we have iteration. Whenever you think about loops, think about iteration. And finally, we have straight sequence. So we don't have any conditionals whatsoever. We have one after the other. Sometimes, remember the ampersand signs, the double ampersand. So we say and one, command one, command two. And that depends on the status code exit of zero. So exit of zero, and the second command runs accordingly, and that could be a sequence only. Another way we can have a sequence is if we just have commands piled up listed together. So we can also have ls, who, who am I? My handwriting is uh, atrocious. We're better at typing sometimes. So ls id who am I, and that's a way to have a sequence of scripting commands. Now they don't interact with each other or do anything else. And they also don't depend on each other, which means you can actually have a fast acting script without any iterations, depending on what your needs are. So to highlight further, if else conditions on how it looks like. Now this is not bash scripting in the format that we'll look at. We'll also look at this in a demonstration perspective, but focus on the actual conditions, focus on the logic itself. Here's a true condition. When we have an integer, a number of five, an integer is a whole number. If it's greater than zero, do something here. If it's not greater than zero, do something else. So if that integer was not five, it was, let's say it was negative one for whatever reason, it would go over here in the else condition, else condition instead of the if condition. Now focus on the false requirements. If the int was integer number was five, and if number, right, 
it's less than zero, do this. In fact, sorry about that. We are going to, if the, if the integer is less than zero, we want to do this. And if I can get my pointer back on, let's try that one last time. If the integer is less than zero, do this. If it's not less than zero, go over here. So we're basically doing the same exact thing. But we're changing the condition around um, really in, in one aspect. The condition goes to greater than or less than, and it really depends on what the value up here is. What is number? So it's the same exact if else condition statement requirements, only you're changing your condition to be after or before. So let's look at forward while loops again. Focus on the logic, not necessarily the syntax itself. For a specific condition, we start and finish on something and we update until the condition is broken. We can also include an if statement inside, which we call nested conditionals. So for every, uh, for your initial variable of one through 10, do something such as uh, update the a uh, conditional statement, update the variable of what you're trying to do, and then we can break out if necessary. So when you use uh, for loops, you want to use for loops for when you have a finite range, a condition that you know is going to be from one to the other. When should you use while loops? While loops are based on the condition until it breaks that condition. So if something is considered true, it's going to continue doing this right here until that false condition happens. While loops should be really utilized when you don't know when the stop condition is going to happen, and your stop condition is going to be somewhere in here as you make your calculations, and eventually it'll break out and iterate while until something happens. So the for is when you want to use a range. The while is when you want to iterate until something else can, uh, stops it. We'll see some additional use cases and examples on how that makes sense uh, in a little bit. Finally, we also have regular expressions. Regular expressions are actual logical metadata characters. So for instance, if I want to represent the starting position of a string, I would have the up caret right here, and then something here. And then it could search for exactly that. And remember, it's case sensitive, just like um, Linux. So remember that regular expressions are actually almost its own language. So for here, we're assessing, we want three characters from A to Z. And, and that's how we express it inside regular expressions. If we want any of these characters right here, we're going to group them and we're going to say, hey, look for A, B, A or B or C or F or G, et cetera. Now, if we also want to say, hey, we're looking for any characters uh, uh, between A and Z, and that's uh, uppercase, that is our group, group letter here. And then we can also say, hey, look for something that's in particular 0 through 9 four times, some sort of numerical right here. And then of course, we have potentially any character, just one instance of the alphabet. So remember that unless you have a quantifier, and what we mean by quantifier, see these little squiggly lines right here? We're saying something up, quantification up. So as, we, as soon as we define one character at a time based on a set, we have to quantify it with how much we want to see each other. Pipes are considered ORs instead of piping like Linux Bash, where you have input and output. Consider piping a logical OR. Let's look at some other examples here. If I want to look up some sort of link that is happening here, I want to match on this. Well, we want to have a start of the, uh, the expression right here. And we're going to test it using regex 101, which we'll demonstrate as well. And what we're saying is escape this with a backslash. So this backslash means escape. And this grouping, uh, and we also want to say not make it a grouping, but we also want to say look for the literal character of the, uh, the opening bracket right here. And then a zero or more of anything for infinity, which is already filled up right here. So we're looking for the square bracket. Oops. Looking for the square bracket. square bracket right here, and then we want to fill it with zero or more of anything, 
followed by the ending bracket, which is a literal. Also a literal with a open parentheses and a closed parentheses right here, and one or more, zero more of anything in here. And while that could match a whole bunch of stuff, that's not really a great use of regular expressions, but that's something that will get you started. So basically, let's sum it up. This is basically saying, look for the literals of each of the groupings and say for zero or more of anything in here, match it. Well, you can think about performance wise, zero to infinity doesn't make a lot of sense. You wanna make sure you have regular expressions as constrained as possible. Here's another example. We can say we want something at the start of the line, right here, we're using our up caret. And then we can say, hey, we also want to make sure with a grouping of lowercase a to z and zero through nine. And we also want to have the uh, underscore as well as hyphen, also an inclusive thing that I want to find. And based on that character set, I also want to make sure not is it only at the start of a line and within that character set, it has got to be between three and 15 letters. And then that is the end of the line. So how we group everything together, Let's take a look. I think it's time for a demo and a short break. We'll see you after the break. Have a great break, and then we'll catch you thereafter. All right, welcome back. I hope you had a great break. Let's dive a little bit deeper. Let's dig into what it means to have a shell script. Now, we went over a bunch of different concepts, but it doesn't exactly seem clear until we start practicing this. So let's first um, get ahead of what we're going to do for our script. Well. We're going to go ahead and go to demo files. And what I have is a uh, my first shell script. And in that, you can also copy and paste from your, your reading material um, the different aspects and follow along. So please feel free to follow along with this, with this uh, video and also get your terminal screen up to go and prepare to utilize all of what we have in this course um, so you can get that tactical experience going. All right, so you can copy and paste or you can type it along with me. It's up to you. First things first, let's go ahead and create our, our file. So we'll use a Vim. I like to use Vim because it has color codes. You can use anything you want, including Nano uh, or whatever other text editor you may find as you explore this course. We'll say my first script, SH for shell script. And we'll Vim that and we'll create a slash uh, bank sh uh, shebang, which is uh, user bin and bash just in case. And then we'll basically do a basic sequence level uh, bash script. So we'll say echo and anything you can do inside a bash shell, you can do it inside a script. This is my first script that won't do much. And then we're going to use IPIR ping C3 1211, which is a DNS server. We'll run date. So basically we're running a sequence with no conditionals. We just want to say, run this as fast as you can, um, one after the other. Now we'll do an LS on my first script. And we'll notice that we don't, let's check out our permissions. We don't have execute permissions. So we'll try to execute it and notice that we can't. So we'll have to do chmod plus X, my first script. And then let's check our permissions one last time and boom, we can, now remember that chmod plus x means x across all your um, all your groups. So if you don't want anyone to access it and execute it, make sure you uh, use chmod plus uh, x only on the user or the group level membership requirements. And notice that we have here we're running everything in sequence, and we have pings going on, which means we're checking on a a particular server. We've listed our uh, our configurations here for our network cards and our IP addresses. And then of course our original echo statement followed by the date and time of our run here. Not very exciting, but really if you have something that is repetitive and it doesn't require a lot of conditionals, you can certainly utilize those uh, as necessary. Now the one thing we also need to know is that variables happen. Variables are what make things a little bit more interesting with your scripts. Other than a sequence of commands, you're gonna have different things happen. So let's mock some stuff up before we go out and create our scripts. Uh, now we have a variable like shell, which really shows us in most cases what our shell uh, default shell is. In this case, it's pretty empty. So let's double check what our shell is here. We'll do an echo 
shell, and we have bin bash. Now, when we reference an environment variable or any kind of variable that's in our environment, you have to echo it, and you have to re reference it with a dollar sign in front of it. So let's create our first variable here. Uh, before we do that, let's figure out what environment means. So environment, you saw that it was being ran in the, uh, the bin bash uh, shebang. If you run an environment by itself, it's actually going to print out all your path and variables in your current session state right now, which is really cool. Notice that we don't have the dollar sign in front of shell. We have the dollar sign when we need to reference it. So where are we at right now? Well, you can do a man and environment, and it'll tell you what you can use with that. Again, find your own help if necessary. We'll do environment head of uh, N3. Just see the first three lines, and we see exactly what our uh, shell variable might look like. To create our own variable, we'll have to do this. Uh, we can say some variable equals uh, foo. Notice that we have to have no spaces in between and no references to the dollar sign. Press enter, and now we do echo, and now we reference it some var, and now we have foo. Now, it's very important that this is for the session by itself. It's not meant to be used anywhere else, and so you can actually unset it to some var, and then now we echo some var again, and it's now empty. Nothing's in there um, at, at all whatsoever. Let's try to do something else. So we want to go ahead and create uh, something that our script can read uh, as an environment variable from within. So we'll go ahead and uh, create some var equals ref by shell. And then we'll go ahead and echo some var again. And we have it for use for internal needs. Now we can use the export command. If you want to find out more about it, again, manual export or export tech tech help. And it'll give you a little bit more to refer on to. So let's export some var. And now we can use it as an external reference to variable during our terminal session by running our first shell script. Let's go ahead and modify my first shell script. And then now we want to say, hey, let's go ahead and comment these out with our, our hashtags here. The only exception to the comments are really the original shebang. And now we can say echo some of our with the dollar sign. Notice the colors have changed. Right click. And let's run that first shell script yet again. And we should see two echo statements refers by shell. So now the shell can reference the external variable as soon as you exported that. And that can be ran from within as well. OK. Now that we have a little bit of a taste about sequencing and how we can change different variables and assign something, let's figure out what we can do with variables as a whole. All right, so let's go ahead and use my first shell script again to edit that for our sake and purposes. So let's go ahead and edit these. And well, we can go ahead and delete this line. We don't really care about them. We can use the declare external statement and variable. And we can say, let's declare very specific variables together. x equals 10, y equals 20. Then now we can say with a uh, natural statement, z equals x plus y. And then now we write to make sure we save that change. And then now we can say echo now reference a variable evaluated. And then we can say, hey, we have z, close our string. And let's run that one last time. Very cool. It evaluated with sim simple math. And we can showcase different items, but declare is a really great way to say, if you want to not just have strings as your evaluation, you can have integers and many other variables if you want to do some simple calculations. Now, that's not enough. Sometimes we need our scripts to be interactive or be prepared to really get uh, some user information. So first things first, let's go ahead and uh, comment whatever we don't need out. And of course, I need to go ahead and comment these out. And let's go ahead and say echo, enter your username here. Actually, your, your name and press. Enter. Read user input, which means I am creating a new variable. 
And now uh, that is a variable that is only accessible within the script. You won't be able to see user input outside of that, as we'll see shortly. You entered user input. Save and quit. Now, because we didn't export it, user input is not mirror, it's not at all initiated. Nothing's there. One, we didn't export it. Two, we didn't initiate it. So this initiates at the runtime of the script. And we'll say, foo, hey, we got exactly what we're looking for. So it's a really simple use case of grabbing string input and being able to do something with that. Now let's talk about positional arguments. So we saw with LS, right? We have positional arguments with multiple options. And then with the copy or move, right? You have to say a source and a destination right up here along with your options. These are positional arguments where it's, uh, the, the position actually matters. Well, the cool thing about Bash is that it has a built-in mechanism for referencing something that you can feed as a positional argument. So let's go ahead and comment these out. We might use them later, who knows? All right. So if you say, uh, I wanna see echo argument one, we'll reference them that as using the defaults, which is uh, one echo argument two, dollar sign two, and an echo argument three. Again, these are positional arguments. So they're not gonna know based on keyword, they just know that you have put spaces and some word or something as input to your script. All right, let's go ahead and right quit that. So if I run my script, it's not gonna have anything, right? I have no arguments. But if I run it with some positional arguments, uh, position one, uh, help me, we are. Now I have argument one, two, and three referenced in default variables. Now I can have that reference in my scripts as new variables um, or be able to use it as an ability to reference a file, perhaps as input. So now let's go a little bit step further. Let's go ahead and use my uh, first shell script. Um, go ahead and comment those out. And then let's go ahead and, you know, I'm just gonna keep adding at the top. You know, I wanna keep worrying about this. And then we're gonna say, hey, let's, um, let's not only just read from my argument, let's read from a variable and then let's turn it into an argument right after that. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. So we can say my file equals um, sample text dot sample dot text. And then we can say while, right? Well, now we're using our first while do while loop, while read line do something. And I press enter and notice that there's a tab here, echo line, which is just echoing each line in the iteration of the variable right here. And then I'm gonna say done. Notice that it automatically went back. And now I can say my input is my file. I'm gonna right click that. Now we have to create my file, which is obviously something that has to be called sample.txt. So I'll just cat real quick, make sure I actually got it right, which is uh, sample, right? I could actually did a better job and say uh, grep i sample and got the actual string name that I wanted to call myself. So echo something is here. Um, and I don't need to redirect that. We'll redirect that to sample.txt. Perfect. And let's fire off my sh first shell script again. And it echoed it accordingly. Now that's not really fun and that required a lot of hard coding. And we don't want to hard code a variable. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So let's go ahead and edit that to do something else. So we can actually say my file can be combined with read user as a read state. So we can do this. We can say, hey, um, echo, enter the file name to read from, and we'll say read my file. And comment that out, right and quit. So we're, we're actually cascading what we just learned. My first shell script, and I'm gonna say sample.txt, boom. 
Now we have some interaction. Well, how about if we needed to make this a lot more automated? We don't want interaction uh, and waiting on user input. That's okay too. So let's go ahead and delete these. And then we can actually say my file equals position argument one. Now we go ahead and say sample.txt. And again, it reads it directly from there using what we just learned about variables, reading user input, as well as uh, the arguments uh, in between them. Now if we added something else to samples.txt, um, which is um, sequence zero through 10. Oops, I, there we go. So we do sequence zero to 10. We can go ahead and append that to sample.txt and cat sample.txt. And now we have multiple lines here. In fact, we have 11 lines if we did a work count. Well, sorry. Uh, that includes the zero all the way through uh, 12 and something is here. All right, so let's go ahead and run our script again. And now it's just echoing that out. Now let's do something a little bit more interesting. Let's see if we can add all of those together or do something else with that. Well, we'll get that. We'll get to that in a second. Let's focus on what else we can use with conditionals. We had a little sample of that using our conditionals. So let's edit our script. As we read the line, we can read that line and not just echo that line, but we can also do this. Um, we can use some of our declare statements what we just looked at a look alert earlier, we can declare that uh, line is an integer. And then we can also say um, we can always multiply it by 10. So we can say um, new value equals uh, line times 10. Echo new value. Now for that, we might get an error because we need to remove the old uh, uh, our sample information, which is uh, vim sample. We need to remove anything that is not a integer. So we'll say um, delete this one here, right click. And that's a DD sequence in your side of your vim. And let's run that and ambiguous redirect. Oh, because we didn't specify our, our sample file. And now that we have here is nine is not a valid identifier. And we're having some quite a bit of issues here. Let's see what happened here. We have zero through 10. Let's get out of there. And we'll bend that. And let's see what happened here. So declare line. Our declare statement is not exactly having a fun time here. And so what we can also do is we'll use something called uh, export or we can use eval. And we will find that accordingly down here using expressions. So instead of using declare, maybe we don't need to make this overly complicated. I'm sure if I thought about it a little bit longer, I can always go ahead and uh, change that over. So we'll, okay, we'll instead of echoing new line, I'm going to say for every read of line, right? Line is that, uh, that variable that we want to make an integer. We should express. Um, let me add the lines together and see what the uh, outcomes are for each iteration. So we'll add the next line over and over again and see what it looks like. It should be pretty fun. All right, so we'll use express, which is an expression statement instead of declare, which is gonna do us the same thing. We're gonna say add line to line and see if it makes a difference. My first script and we'll do sample.txt. And now we've doubled up and added them to each other. And Declare probably didn't like what we had going on uh, because it probably had a new line. 
uh, expression has a different, more free-flowing capability of giving you basic calculations. So we were adding uh, for each iteration the line before last to each other and essentially giving different numbers. Uh, so that's how you can really manipulate some of that data. So I wanted to give you that, that uh, nice introduction, gentle introduction to uh, the iteration of loops and uh, taking in data and doing something with it. Okay, so let's go ahead and comment everything out. And let's go ahead and start off on something new. So we talked about conditionals. We're, so far, we've kind of used it with while, right? While we open up uh, input of the file here um, with the ingestion of done, and we read line by line, and do the following until it's done. Okay, well, it's kind of acting more like a for loop than anything else. Um, why don't we do this? Why don't we count by iterations and figure out how we need to do a do while loop based on a, a stop condition, more so than just waiting for a read line. All right, so we'll say echo uh, print out max line number. And then we'll say uh, we'll read into the variable max. And we'll say count equals one. That's a new variable altogether. And we're saying explicitly count equals one inside my script. So while condition, and we'll set with uh, a double open um, brackets, we'll say reference count and make that less than the max. So our read the max line output, max line number that we'll say count starts off as one. And as long as it's less than whatever my max I enter in from the user input is, it's going to do something. Okay, we have the double brackets done. We'll do a do, press enter, and then notice how it automatically formats it for me in, in uh, Vim. I'm going to echo printing uh, out count iteration. And then we're going to have to actually inc increment that count because otherwise one will be less than my max forever as long as I entered in something more than one. So for that, you have to use parentheses. And something's very special right here, which is evaluating itself and then uh, as an expression and then uh, updating itself. So we'll use a count plus plus. Uh, and more importantly, we do not have the dollar sign attached to it. It's just gonna be incrementing itself uh, based on Bash's capability of reading the old, um, kind of like C style context. And we'll learn more about C as we look forward into, uh, into later sections which is the same, this is really the same as saying uh, count equals count plus one inside these uh, parentheses. So we'll exit out of there and we'll run our script instead, our first script, and we'll print out max line number 10. And now it went through iteration of one through 10, incrementing itself and then exiting that while condition uh, accordingly because our max out um, eventually stopped at 10. So that's how we do a, um, an iteration there. Now let's think about for loops. So we have uh, these clear and we have these unknown conditions um, as it's going through the loop. But what about in a range? So we kind of know sometimes what a max might be. We may not. Well, if we do know, we maybe we should use a for loop instead of a while loop. Uh, a while loop has uh, dangerous attributes sometimes if you don't actually set a condition like count plus plus, which gives you an infinite loop, unfortunately. So make sure whenever possible. Use the for loop if you have a finite range that you know that you're going to be iterating over. So we'll say, for instance, here's how you do it. For i, which is some sort of iteration, and this is a list of strings, right? So we actually have one, two, three, four, five, six different elements inside my strings, um, which is kind of unique. And we'll see, we'll say do, and then we'll echo element i is uh, i. Um, i. So we'll reference that based on our internal loop. And then we'll do a done. And my first script again. So each one of these is actually an element inside a list, a list of strings. And of course, that increases when we say something else, something add it here, and save it again, and um, write and quit. 
run it one last time. And of course, it iterates over whatever it needs to be. Another way to use a for loop, other than having a very defined list of a long string candor right here, you can do, um, uh, by the way, something I wanted to add in here is that you can also break a large line together. So if it gets kind of long, you can actually do a backslash and then let it continue right here. So it actually, you don't get penalized for using um, the backslash to break apart a line together. So that backslash turns yellow um, in, in VI Modern, of course. And of course, you can do other things. So if you don't need to have a list of strings, you can also have an iteration of a range. So for i in um, expand 0 through 5, right, just like we did with a to z in our last um, uh, lecture, do echo whatever here. And then we have it done. And we get very similar approaches, which is 0 through 5 as our integer iteration, as opposed to a list of strings. Now we got that. Now we have another thing called case statements. And these are really cool. Case statements uh, are not supported in every programming language. And the fact that a shell script can do it, uh, which makes it even better. So let's go ahead and make a case statement. So echo, enter your uh, first name. And then we're going to say read first name, defining a variable. Now we're going to use our case syntax. We'll say case reference the first name in. Now it automatically um, gives it to us. We'll, we'll have Bob and we'll say echo terrible name. Sorry if there's anyone named Bob in our cohort. Um, we're just using this as for fun. We must also enter in each case with a semicolon and press enter. Go back, make our case two, Dennis. And we'll say echo best name ever. Backspace, Jane. Sorry for anyone that says name Jane too. Uh, echo, and you got a so-so name. Let's have some fun with it, right? Semicolon, semicolon, and then we have a catch all, which is your default. So if it doesn't match any of the above, we just don't know them. We have a default catch all, and that is going to be echo. I have no uh, default opinion. And okay, semicolon. And then just like with um, some loops and iterations, you have done right here. Uh, we're going to also do a if else soon, but notice that. Uh, case is going to have to be spelled backwards. So as we have a case statement, because it's an if else condition, we have uh, E S A C, which start and ends. Remember that anything that has an if and else decision point, as opposed to a loop iteration inside bash shell, you have um, the forward name uh, statement, and then you have the backwards ending statement accordingly. And we'll see this in a second uh, with if else. Write and quit. My first script. Uh, Dennis, sure, best name ever, Jane, and of course, Foo, which is the default. So way to great, uh, get nice branching going on with uh, if else's or with multiple ifs uh, without having to nest anything. So using case statements, if you have a default um, one route need, that's what you can do. Um, so we also have, we can also do additional items. So we, let's do a if then else statement. It's something that we uh, want to do before we stop this lecture or stop at this point for a pause and a break. Let's go ahead and count all these out. And again, you can copy and paste these from the, uh, the lecture material. It's just that it's better if you type them out and go slower to really understand what you're typing and get a good sense of the scripting and automation that will be coming much later. Uh, just like with the case statement, we want to do if then else. So if else is a decision uh, based on the condition. So echo, uh, enter some number. So we're going to have continued interaction. Obviously, we're going to read it into a var, some sort of variable. And then we're going to say if, here's our conditional, just like we did with uh, the other ones. If variable uh, is greater than 2, then instead of do, sure. Of course. 
Um, and then of course we have an else. Um, echo variable less than two greater than two. And then we'll also have our ending, which I said is a backwards version of the original uh, decision, which is fi backwards for if. Now you don't need the else, you can always have it, but um, you can have a bunch of else's uh, depending on what your conditional statement looks like. We'll write and quit, and then go ahead and do my first script, two, and then less than two, because it's not or equal to. Uh, and then we also have 10 greater than two, and so that's our if else conditional statement. Uh, be sure to look at the documentation and guidelines accordingly. Let's take a quick break, soak a lot of a little bit of that stuff up, reference your labs, reference your reading material, and then let's get back to work on actually applying all these cases together. All right, welcome back. Hope you had a great break. Let's go ahead and continue on of making requirements and use cases. So. One of the things that we have is that we don't always need to make a super script for it. We don't need to have something that's overly complex. Keep things simple as much as possible. So for instance, if I wanted to recursively look up a very uh, unique string, such as creating, recursively looking up a uh, one one, uh, actually, let me paste it over here. One, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, so five, six, and so on to nine, because it's pretty unique and I've injected it into multiple files. Um, and we'll start off by looking for the current directory recursively uh, for any text file. And so we don't really see anything that has that string, uh, but we can also say, start off with slash home uh, and maybe my username as well if desired. And now we've come up with something under demo files and we've triggered all of these and we've gotten the absolute value name uh, the file name as well as the payload that was triggered and what was triggered, right? And we can also make this uh, a substring search, so right? you don't have to have nine nine eight eight seven seven. You can have six six, and it'll get the same result. Uh, the goal is that you want to be as as precise as possible. Now, there's a few things that we need to think about here. And what if I just wanted to grab this part only, or maybe only this part? Well, we can think about playing with the grep commands, well, man grep, but why don't you do that on your own right now? As you go through this, we have this, and let's say we want to filter on any text files. Oh, nope, it's not gonna let me do that, which is kind of funny. Um, so that's fine with me. Now we can also use uh, S slash S and slash O to suppress errors and all kinds of stuff like that. Now we don't have some payload trigger, we only have whatever is triggered to reduce our actual output. We really want to aim for what kind of files are these are. Now let's cut those files just like we had last time. Let's cut them out. So we'll use cut dash D for the dimmer. We have our colon that is obvious right here. And then we're going to use a, uh, a filter of one. And we're going to grab this time, not the payload, but the actual files that have been affected. Now let's say our use case requires that we don't need to know just the file names. We need to be able to copy those files to a temporary place. So let's say this string is very important to the company for a project number, and we want to make sure we back up that specific project number based on our use case needs. Well, with that, we'll, we'll add on to what we have here. We have um, a uh, set of absolute file names that we can copy over, and we have a couple of other options that we can use. Well, we can also use what's called um, another pipe to what a copy command. And unfortunately, it won't take standard input and put it somewhere because it's missing a destination after it. it doesn't know where to put it. Um, and so it's not actually taking standard input, it's taking a very specific path that you have to specify. So these are not gonna take uh, to the copy um, command properly. So what can we do? Well, we have another command called xargs. Now xargs by itself is not enough when you do a copy command. So we can say copy and tell it to be uh, input to the argument or put it at the end because uh, that's what the default is. So XRs will actually turn certain output into a, a positional argument for you. Unfortunately, this is still not working because you have to be at the first of the position, not at the end. 
So what do we need to do with this? So if you man page the XARGs, you will also find that uh, XARGs uses a very specific uh, positional option, which is cool. You can do a dash I, and then you can say, specify whatever you want your positional argument name to be as a uh, inline variable. So we'll say that's who wants to be our source. Um, and then we'll create a copy source to slash temp and press enter. And voila, we have everything copied. We can verify this via um, that slash temp or anything that has a text file. And now we have um, our copies created accordingly. Now, if you don't remember what that looked like earlier and why that worked, let's go ahead and mock it back up by, um, by here. And we're saying my test script files one, two, and four um, was copied just now at the time 2207 in today's date. So that at the minimum of our product, that's the great output that we needed. We copied exactly what we wanted to to another destination. Well, that's that's great. But now let's think about it from what we need from a legal perspective. So there's a certain concept called legal e-discovery. In e-discovery, you go into court and you have to have proof that you didn't mess with something you have file integrity and nothing has changed um, in the transactional period that you are extracting and copying those files. And doing e-discovery, many times you have to search files based on subjects or strings inside of them. And you have to make sure that the source matches the destination. Well, we're gonna get halfway there and we'll, we're gonna do one more extra step. We're gonna hash the files that we have so far. So what do we do? Well, let's play with what we have here. We have this. And then we do XRX, we do five sum. It already hashes this for us and gives us nice, nice output. All right, we have that output. And if we actually made it into a and, a double ampersand saying, hey, if that completed successfully, do something else, we can go ahead and do an LS. Um, LS on the slash temp directory and have that output as well be part of that MD5 sum um, accordingly. So we'll have anything that has, in this case, demo files tech. Or we'll say any text files, for instance, uh, test.txt. And great. And then we'll grab that and expand to XRS and the Fox in itself. And now we can compare both of them in both directories having the same ND5 fingerprint sum um, accordingly. Now, obviously this requires you to have hard-coded this. You can obviously um, have what you originally copied over into a log file, and I'll leave you to do that. Think about what it takes to actually get to that full automation of comparing two files for, uh, for uh, file hashing or comparing two log files based on the file hash, right? If this had to be 8B and this had to be 8B from the source and destination, how can you do that in a script? Pause there and think about this for a second. All right, we're back. Remember that you can always use if then else or you can use case statements as part of that, right? You're making a decision based on something. If something's false and something's changed based on two file names that are uh, identical regardless of the uh, absolute path, maybe you might raise an alert. Well, that's all we really need it for now. We are, you can always redirect that to a log file and continue on your automation journey. Now, ultimately, we have a one-liner that met our MVP requirement. And really, you can mock everything up inside an interactive shell and do what you need to do uh, inside a script file. One of the other things that you can do is also mock things up uh, in line, like I said. So if we do a, um, if we go to demo files and file test my grep for that text, right? we have file and we can cut dash D and then cut for items here. Now we're going to test. Well, let's say I want to do e-discovery based on uh, only if it's a text file, no binaries or nothing like that. Well, we can do uh, 
somewhat what we were looking for. And we can also look at and extend our use case. So now that we've mocked up an MVP, a minimum viable product in a one-liner, that one-liner, in case you forgot, was uh, pretty much this. We can do something a little bit further. So I'm not going to recreate the will, but I am going to say uh, e-discovery script.sh. I'm going to paste in right here, and you can also follow along in the, uh, the student guide. I'm going to paste in here what I already made. Uh, and instead of using the absolute path of bin bash, I'll be a good person and use um, user slash bin environment bash, which is the next best thing. And let's read up from top to bottom here. That's how the computer reads. We're going to say we're going to take a read string in. We're going to grep it and cut it for it if it is an ASCII file or not uh, by making sure it goes into the files to copy temp file. We're going to make a matched files temporary directory. So let's say that the customer doesn't care where it is. It's sort of always going to be in the same place. And now we do a while read line, right? While the files are all uh, read by the, the log file right here, files to copy, do a file command on each one of them and say, do you see the word text anywhere in the description like we saw with ASCII earlier? If you do, then copy that to the match files and do into done completion. Now, cat all the files to copy in XRs and make sure it gets matched up. Now I'll leave it to you to determine I'll, if the source and the destination match up, adding your own logic here. What does that look like here? Well, we'll go ahead and right quit here. And just for uh, the sake of non-cleanup, I'm going to comment this out so you can have a look at what this looks like as a temp file. Right quit, hmod plus x e discovery. Right. And then we'll e discovery, which is stream search. Uh, I don't know, one, one, two, two, three, four, four. And now it's going to search quite a bit of different things. And it found this string and it um, copied the file. It already existed. And then where is our temp file? Well, let's go back to our item here. And we'll say files to copy temp was never deleted. And let's do an ls real quick. And then we'll cat files to copy temp. Notice that it found exactly the absolute path variable that we had. Um, and then it was going to make that decision based on that if these were text files or not based on what file looked like. So uh, file some uh, file. Let's use this, save a little bit of time. And because it copied, it was going to copy over anyways, because it saw the word text in the description. And then of course, uh, we have a file, uh, make directory already exists. And it was copied anyways uh, from there. So we'll go ahead and look at slash temp slash uh, match files. And we see that some file one and two were already there. And we have our MD5 hashed matched files accordingly. Cool. Well, that's really nice. Um, now, that's a process that we need only one a few times. Maybe you might put it in a cron job. Remember that we use cron tab E for that. And you can put that in a cron job and run that every so often um, on off office hours, but you want to run that constantly. So for us to have a continuous process, we kind of want that to be a service. Now, this would not qualify as a good candidate to be a process, right? Even though it's a great script, maybe, we only need to run it at certain occasions. It doesn't need to be running all the time. Another one might be to run uh, a, a program to listen on a port for commands and to uh, log those commands or to uh, run a web server, for instance, that would qualify as a good service. Now, we can create our own scripts that actually do that. So let's go back to our desktop. And front working directory just for fun. And again, we can use netcat for this. So we'll say netcat uh, 8443. Again, don't worry too much about this. We're just going to say, hey, um, netcat.log, so it's going to be in our uh, directory. And whatever we send to it, it's going to be uh, logging into standard out um, and redirected accordingly. So remember that um, 
Remember that we have a loopback adapter that's always on 127.001. That listens to anything. And so we do net stat and grep I8443. We know we're listening to that. Um, and we're going to output the standard out to um, a file that we've just created right here that you can see on the desktop right now. Uh, and then just for the sake of um, assurance, you know, we want to see who's running what um, that has that socket open to begin with. So we'll use LSR and boom, we know it's me running Netcat. And of course, if you want to dig a little bit deeper, as a reminder, you can use PSEF. And bam, you can see the exact syntax and argument parameter names and the PID and if we need to kill it or not. We won't do that for now. And if I want to really connect to it, I can use netcat as a connector as well. And I can connect to uh, myself, which is my host, and say, hello there. And I can kill the connection if I want it with Control-C. And now I have hello there, output it to a log. That's just great. I don't necessarily care about that. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that in a trash can. OK, so we now know our proof of concept kind of works, and that's what we're looking to do. How do I turn that into a service, assuming that as a useful service to begin with? Well, let's create the script. And a script that's not going to be terribly uh, difficult. We can do use it in a script, or we could use it in a line. Uh, first things first, we can do it in a script via um, you know, a netcat listener or a chat listener. Why not? Listen, er, and of course we can use our shebang. And we can actually do the same thing. Uh, netcat, say okay, P8443. And we can also say output to slash temp, right? Output whatever you see here in slash temp, you know, my listener, that log, or, or whatever it may be. But because it's such a simple line and we don't need to do anything else, why do we need to have an actual shell script for that? You can do that if you want, but we also can do it via a one-liner. Because it's a one-liner, we don't necessarily really have to do that. But let's use our argument um, and pretend that this is a really complex script. So we'll use uh, some variables. So we'll use some variable that says, hey, uh, in position argument one, define your variable, uh, your which is going to be our port in this case, the listen on eight four forty three or something else, and then output it to wherever you want, which is position argument two. That we can only do with a shell script. Again, chmod plus x and cat chat listener, and then if we test it out, right, we're going to say, hey, listen on eight thousand. And output whatever you see to temp foobar.txt. Now it works without any issues. Um, and then, of course, without it, let's see what the standard error looks like. Ambiguous redirect. Ambiguous redirect because we don't have our argument inputs accordingly. So, this is our correct line. We need to have a listening port that we can choose in line as our arguments and our destination of our log file, uh, whatever it gets ingested into that port. All right, so that's time to register a service. And really, this is a great time to say, well, let's look at our, um, our access so far. We have plenty of execution, which is great. And now we're going to go ahead and uh, create a service based on this, OK? So let's create a service. And to create that service, we're going to go ahead and do this. And I'm going to grab my little template here. I thought I had my template. Let's go ahead and grab another template here. And we'll go ahead and use the service template that I created earlier. Yep, we'll copy and paste that out. Of course, I could have done the same thing. Then in cat chat listener that service. And I'm going to add that in as Again, this is not executable. This is data only, a configuration file. We'll save it and we'll say, hey, instead of having a direct line requirement here, which I could have done because this is a one line need, we could have said, 
well, um, run my script. So I can say user bin and wherever I'm gonna put it accordingly. So where am I gonna put this? Well, the most logical choice for me of putting uh, my next cat listener, chat listener is to copy it to user slash bin because it's for users. I can actually copy it there. Oh, I accidentally had the dot sh not complete. And I permission denied. Well, I can copy it into using sudo. Great. Copy command complete. I can do a ls on uh, user bin netcat listener. chat listener, and it's now there using tap tab. So I can just ls there and it's been perfectly fine, copied reasonably. Uh, let's make sure that's executable though. So we can use um, slh user bin netcat chat listener.sh and it's executable, root owns it perfectly fine. All right, so now that we have our path of where it should be, because we don't want to get overwritten in a upgrade later on with Ubuntu. Um, we'll go ahead and put that into exec start statement, write and quit, and that is a service file. So a service file is something that is a, um, a particular file that is for uh, instrumenting how the system control service will register. So now that we have our file, we're going to go ahead and copy that file accordingly. And copy, and we'll need to sudo this netcat chat listener service to slash Etsy. Remember that has all the uh, configurations. Uh, we need to copy it to slash Etsy. Um, and then we have the system D, which is what system control uses. System. And then we can copy it to that. Um, exact folder, enter in our pseudo information. Now, with that in there, we can go ahead and um, go ahead and go ahead and get started on registering this as a service. So to do that, we can go ahead and move this along accordingly. So let's go ahead and grab the details. Again, this is all inside um the running uh, student guide and let's go ahead and do system control daemon reload and that's basically saying hey go ahead and detect our new changes to our services and now we want to say system enable my uh in cat chat service and you can always tap tab and it'll automatically do that Again, we have the sudo authentication required, fine with me. Simulate create, which is a success, which is awesome. And system control start. So why do you keep going up when you can press uh, start, up arrow key, make it a little bit easier for everyone. I really got to start using sudo, otherwise it's going to keep asking me to do this. Uh, but now I have it started and it doesn't matter. And it failed to load and it exited failure because um, I didn't include the proper registration information in the service file. So, uh, we'll, uh, in the runtime. So, let's go ahead and go back to how that failed. And that failed because I didn't use the arguments. So, um, we'll vim our listener here. service listener. Notice that I didn't include any arguments whatsoever. So now we have to say 8443 and slash temp foo uh, incat. Well, we'll say foo bar incat dot text. Now that's an error condition, which is awesome, which it detected. And uh, for the life of the computer, as long as it has the registration, it should be 
um, good to keep on keeping it alive whenever possible. Um, so we'll get service and we'll copy back all the way again. So sudo, sudo copy um, incat service chat listener to back to the Etsy systemd service directory. D uh, service directory, which is uh, we had that already. System D, oh, oh, uh, system, not service. So at the system perfect. All right, let's try that one last time. I need to really use sudo, skip some of that, but that's okay. Now it's running perfectly fine because we have the arguments in place and we have it actively running. And let's go ahead and try to connect to ourselves one last time. So uh, 127, oopsie, 8443. Hello from service running. Control C, notice that uh, it's still running. Nothing's uh, changing here. We're just getting the output. And then we'll grab the output accordingly. So cat tip, uh, in cat, uh, blue bar, in cat. There we go. Hello from service running. Well, now we gotta clean up this because we don't want this running all the time. And one thing I want you to know is PSEF, gref i, and cat, it's actually running as root. So remember that your service is running as root, uh, which is not always the best thing in the world if you're going to be doing it using uh, that. So if there's a compromise in the permissions, uh, let's say in your um, the shell script or even the service listener, you need to make sure that uh, you have a way of finding it and shutting it down as soon as possible. All right, for that, we can go ahead and stop the service. So I'll use sudo this time because I'm tired of being uh, typing my password in. Stop. Now we're going to use um, remove. Oh, um, the cleanup operation is actually a little bit different. So we're going to go ahead and disable instead. Done. Okay, now we have to do our real cleanup, which is sudo um, rmf, which is force, c system d, system netcat chat listener service. And now, only then, we know it stopped done because this is just showing us that we grepped for NCAT to begin with. Perfect. All right. And if you really want to, you can actually delete the script from the user bin. So you can certainly do that, which I suggest. Cat, um, which we want to remove. Slash user bin slash NCAT. Um, chat plus for service. And voila, we are completely cleaned up from this. Let's take a quick break, absorb what you just learned. And let's follow back up with um, our last exercise of this lecture. Hi, and welcome back. I hope you had a great break. Let's get to our last exercise of this lecture. And let's generate some synthetic data. We're going to go to regex101.com, and we'll learn and practice with our regular expressions together. Let's look for IPv4 addresses. Now, IPv4 addresses look something like this. So in, instead of using Linux, we'll use uh, command prompt with Windows for once. And we're going to go ahead and uh, use ipconfig. And we'll use find string 192.168.20. Um, and if, as you can see, uh, I've essentially done my version of a grep of ipconfig. And that is my IP address and my default gateway internally to the network. I want to uh, uh, 
ipchicken.com, or even ifconfigme.me, it has my external IP address. And notice that they always have four different places of decimals um, separated out, and those are octets. So no one's what our IP addresses might look like um, in different fashion. We know that it could be almost any digit within four different groupings. So let's try something out. So three, four, four, A, B, C, uh, D, E, F, uh, G, H, I, J, K, L. Um, let's try zero, zero, zero. Some misspellings here. All right, these are still four, but maybe not in the correct fashion that you need. And we'll try a really good IP address here, which is maybe internally here, and then we'll try uh, Cloudflare's DNS server. Uh, that's just how it is. If you use the DNS for privacy, Cloudflare DNS is free for anyone to use. All right, so now we need to create our regular expressions. Down here, we have uh, our cheat sheet of what we can use for items. And knowing that we have IP addresses, and we have other stuff here and some junk. We want to capture only the IP addresses. Now remember the IP addresses don't have letters in them, at least IPv4 doesn't. And so we want to say, hey, we only want to capture uh, essentially zero uh, digits or zero through nine. I want to use Perl regular expressions in this case. Well, what we have here, we set any digit, non-digit, and then we're going to have the quantifier of plus. And we find here that you have plus one or more of, that sounds pretty good. So we can say, hey, uh, one or more of, and we have a dot here. So we've already captured um, our first groupings, which is cool. Um, now we're gonna have plus. Notice that it's giving you this equivalent right here. One to many uh, unlimited times. And then we're gonna say, hey, we need to do a dot, but that's not gonna capture what we need. So we wanna go um, a literal, and then we're gonna do this multiple times. And now we've captured what we think is only IPs, but we still have a false positive right here. Um, and then we have issues where around, even though we're not capturing letters, uh, that's not a valid IP address, right? So in essence, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, that is still a valid IP address in its eyes too. So we haven't really captured exactly what we're looking for, but we have a general sense. And so even though we may have false positives, uh, we'll capture enough, maybe a little bit more than we wanted to. Let's try to shore it up a little bit more. Well, instead of having one to infinity, which is kind of kind of crazy, you can't have an IP address that has that many digits. We need to know that there's at least one number and there's a maximum of three numbers, right? Zero through 255 is what our limits are. And so what we really ought to do is do a quantifier, which is a curly bracket, one and between one and three numbers. And so now that we've captured potentially correct IP addresses right here, we can replicate that uh, across because it's always the same field no matter what. So we'll copy that over uh, over here. We'll take out the plus sign because our quantifier is no longer gonna be one to infinity. And now we have one to three and we're capturing um, exactly what we should do. Now look at the leading zeros here. This is still invalid, uh, but it's capturing the last portion of the string. And so that now that we're not capturing all this crazy stuff, we're a little bit more um, accurate in our regular expressions. We're at a point where it's really simple, uh, potentially high performing uh, and minimum false positives. And that's another way to capture um, digits in between. Now let's look at something else. Let's capture um, cities and states. So if I say I'm in uh, Houston, Texas, and some other string fun here, Austin, Texas, and when, you know, when people spell uh, things, they spell it in different ways, right? New York, New York, uh, San Diego, maybe they might do it by accident here, uh, Boulder, Colorado, Fubar, FO, um, something here, something there, something, Every way, and then maybe uh, New Orleans, uh, uh, Louisiana. All right, so we have a variation of things that could be fake and and, and good, good uses of our city and state context. How will we find it? Well, we depending on how freeform it is, we have to make sure that we're capturing what people would enter in. 
this could be a large portion of mistakes and um, strings and other information. And if you did some due diligence that most of the cities start with at least three letters and may go up to 30 letters, if not a little bit longer. So far, we've probably seen about different cities in the US uh, with spaces upwards of 27 characters. And this could be longer over time, but we have to be um, as diligent as possible with our memory resources and capture what we can in all practicality. So what are we looking for? Well, the way people are spelled it could be a mixture of different cases. And uh, because we are in the US, we don't use numbers in our city names, at least not yet. So what we can go ahead and do is say, hey, um, we want to capture group A to Z and A to Z, regardless of the case, right? Only want letters and um, no, no numbers attached. Great. We also want to quantify it with saying, well, start with anything that has three characters or above and upwards of 30 characters. So we're capturing potentially real words here. And then we want to have a literal because, hey, let's assume that they can at least give us a comma. That's our delimiter. A literal, make sure you have a backslash. Uh, comma means something else. And then we also want to capture uh, a, a, a string uh, of letters too. So you can also have uh, A to Z or, um, and we want to quantify as two. So we can also say A to Z, regardless of the um, capture item here, and we'll say quantifier of two. And what we have here is, a, is an issue here that because we don't particularly have um, our matching group properly. So we can say, hey, um, there we go. So why did that work versus this not working? So we actually have to say a string, whoops, A to Z, and then we have to say S. Now we had to say S right here because we have a space, right? A single space digit. So we have any white space character, which we have a, we're assuming that we're doing a comma space value if we were structured. And then we have any character matching set of A to Z non-case sensitive uh, and a aspect of two. Now this doesn't stop us from having a FO foo bar. There is no state in city like that, but we've captured it really closely and with minimal false positives and additional logic, right? We can't just have regular expressions be everything for us. It's really inefficient. So we'll have additional if then else logic or case logic to catch what's not part of our 50 states um, that could be part of it. But we wanna pre-filter as much as possible and provide really accurate data for our input ingestion for conditional statements. Now that was quite a bit. So please be sure to practice our labs and work on uh, different aspects and, and different use cases of our conditional statements and your little scripts either as one-liners or full-fledged scripts. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next lecture.